This video will be part one of chapter nine, Lifespan Sexuality for PSY 345, Human Sexual Behavior. The goal with this chapter is to look at how sexuality develops from our earliest days to, to our last days. Um, consistent with a lifespan view of human psychology, uh, we grow and develop and change consistently across the lifespan uh, based on our physiology, but also based on our social and psychological experiences with our families, with our friends, with our culture at large. Um, all of those are influences that have an impact on how sexuality is experienced and how it's expressed. In infancy, um, and your your chapter starts with kind of a focus on the physiology. Um, how is it that um, biologically we come into the world prepared in some ways for our later functional functional sexual behavior? Um, you know, and and looking at it from its physiological origins, you know, how is the body kind of set up from infancy on for what's later going to be reproductively oriented behavior? but then also for psychologically um, rewarding patterns of behavior that will later show up as a part of our relationship history. Um, so for example, your authors give you some, some highlights about the fact that in infancy, you can see um, penile and clitoral erection um, or evidence thereof. Uh, and it's normal, it's perfectly normal and in fact typical for um, babies in the first, you know, year, two years of life to touch themselves. It's not that they're intending, and you know, Freud kind of hinted and intimated at this, it's not that they're intending to produce orgasm. It's just that so, things that feel good to touch um, or just simply feel different or novel can be interesting to babies. So it's it's self-stimulation, even if it's not intentional, is common. Um, the, the tricky part is from a socialization standpoint, parents are often um, raised to believe that self-stimulation is bad, that it's unhealthy, that it's um, prematurely sexual, um, and therefore they may um, punish the behavior, they may overreact, and uh, infuse such self-exploration with anxiety and guilt. In childhood, when you think of childhood in terms of our traditional definitions of it, from toddlerhood, two-ish, um, to the point prior to puberty, you know, 11 or 12, there's a great deal of uh, change that's going on during that time period. That's a, a fairly extended period of time. Um, What's normal, uh, <laughs> undressing is normal, so exhibitionism. I know in my household when my kids were toddlers, you know, I felt like sometimes we needed to have naked hour just so the kids could run around naked and not worry about it. Um, Self-stimulation continues to be normal, but there's also the fact that during this time period, kids are figuring out how their social world labels gendered behavior um, and how their world deals with sexual behaviors. So if kids are watching, say, parents engaged in um, a sexual behavior, whether it's kissing or they catch them in the bedroom, actually engaged in intercourse, kids are learning things. They may be exposed to older siblings, older relatives, older kids in their neighborhood who are at various stages in their own sexual development, um, and watching is fascinating. So the kinds of things that you're going to see that are normal are things like exhibitionism and self-stimulation, um, but they'll also pick up anxiety because they are routinely told to stop doing these things, that they're wrong, that they're inappropriate. Um, and again, overreactions by parents, caregivers, and, and other people in positions of power, such as teachers, clergy, um, can cause a lot of guilt and anxiety. Um, over the course of childhood, what's been documented in research is that 
the kind of uninhibited behaviors that you see in early childhood start to be replaced by controlled behaviors that are based on the socialization rules in your particular culture. I found this graphic and I found it kind of helpful um, in showing what's expected, what's normal and is not to be an issue of concern um, versus things that are red flags or warning signs that there may be something going on in this child's life that needs to be paid attention to. So, if, for example, on the left side in the light blue, you know, self-stimulation, touching, even masturbating um, is expected, it's common, um, seeing other people touching um, it is pretty typical. Um, showing one's genitals to peers is a pretty typical experience that people report. Um, attempting to see what's new, like trying to catch people naked, um, is something that kids often do. Um, but these behaviors for them to be con con for them to continue to be considered normal and not alarming is that they happen now and then and they tend to um, and children tend to be easily distracted away from them um, less common rubbing up against people trying to uh, use more adult-like behaviors such as uh, pushing one's tongue into someone's mouth while kissing um, Touching older people's genitals, so other kids, peers, and adults touching them in ways that mimic uh, the behavior of adult sexuality. Um, so as it says here in the green, crude mimics of, of sexual acts, sexual behaviors that can be disruptive to other people that aren't, aren't easily distracted. So you can't easily kind of shift the child away from them. So these behaviors are still tra transient and they're moderately um, responsive to distraction, but enough to be of concern because they are somewhat less common. Um, behaviors that are uncommon in children who don't have, say, a history of um, child abuse or other kinds of conditions that may be predictive of these behaviors. If you're, you have a child that's asking for a sexual act, inquiring about a specific sexual act that is beyond their developmental um, stage, uh, it, it explicitly inter, um, imitating sexual acts, including intercourse, um, touching animals inappropriately. Um, these are behaviors that are frequently of concern. So they happen outside the home. They raise alarm bells in other people. The behaviors are persistent and they're hard to get the child to stop doing. Um, over on the purple side, these are rarely normal events and these are, are events that are of great concern and should uh, stimulate um, a, a request for evaluation automatically. Some professionals argue that anything on the, the right hand two columns should alert people to explore the possibility that a child has been has experienced um, some kind of sexual trauma um, whether in the home or outside of the home it can you know at least push you to ask questions so on the rarely normal side you have um, sexual behaviors that are happening between children who are more than four years apart. So if you have, say, siblings or step-siblings, and there's more than four years between them, and they are engaging in sexual acts, um, and n not just, not including the most extreme, not including, say, um, penal vaginal penetration or anal sex, but any kinds of sexual behaviors between those kids. Um, when you have a variety of sexual behaviors being uh, presented in the child's repertoire every day, um, sexual behaviors that cause distress in the person, um, in the child, and they're distressing to others as well. Um, additions of physical aggressiveness to the sexual behaviors that are being exhibited, um, and ex expressing behaviors that involve coercion. 
Um, so, you know, it's, it's never normal to see a child who mimics being bound or restrained, for example. Um, these behaviors, when they become persistent and the child gets angry, if interfered with, obviously that is a, uh, of great concern. So what do psychologists say are um, additional ways of thinking about red flag behaviors in childhood sexual, um, in the childhood sexual realm? Um, well, you know, research on this is challenging for, for researchers, but you know, the bottom line, if you have a behavioral pattern that occurs often enough and can't be redirected, if it's causing emotional or physical pain, um, if the child is injuring themselves or others, if there's aggression involved, if there is force or coercion involved, and there's an overt um, imitation of adult sexual acts, that's problematic and very of great concern. Um, and I've included the link here for where I found this information um, at an organization called Healthy Children. And what they they are doing with this information is trying to encourage people who have frequent interactions with children to recognize red flags that a child may have been um, exposed to sexual trauma, um, either in the home or outside of the home. Now, many of you on your cards at the very beginning of the semester indicated you wanted a better understanding of sexuality education. There's a there's a, a lot of literature out there, a lot of research. Um, I'm going to play a video clip here for you um, in a second, and I will also put this on the YouTube playlist, and I will attach it into D2L um, in case the audio is poor. Certainly not true all the time, but we didn't get a lot of chance to talk about sex or ask questions about it, and certainly not to explore it. So what happened to all that sexual curiosity and energy and interest? Sometimes it got driven inside and became anxiety. Sometimes people acted on it outwardly, and they got branded outcasts and rebels. Advertising figured out that they could use that to sell us everything from toothpaste to Tupperware. Television teased us with sexual innuendo or gave us uh, shows about lifeguards running on the beach in slow motion. And then came easy access internet porn and things really got messy. So how do we deal with this? How do we become a people who can look at sex honestly and confidently and who can see sex as a way to make ourselves better people and our world a better place. That's my job. I teach comprehensive, progressive sexuality education in a little high school just outside of Philadelphia. And I wanted to share a couple of ideas with you today that might help us get our hearts and minds in a better place when we think about sex and sexuality. Now, when I say sexuality, what I mean is the way that our bodies, our gender, our sexual and romantic orientations come together to make us who we are and impact how we put ourselves in the world and how the world reacts to us. See, we're not sexually active people 24 hours a day, seven days a week. That would be exhausting. But we are sexual people. 
from the moment we're born to the moment we die every minute of every day. Our sexuality is a fundamental facet of our humanity. We can't separate ourselves from it. And so we have to learn how to deal with it in positive and healthy ways. So the place to start would be to think about what's our bottom line belief when it comes to sex. When push comes to shove, what do you really think about it? What does your gut tell you? Let's do a little thought experiment. So I'm going to say a letter of the alphabet. And I want you to think of the very first sexually related word or phrase that pops into your head. Okay? I'm not going to ask you to share these out loud. Although later they might make for some great conversation. So just trust your gut. Don't overthink this, okay? Here we go. A. Okay. Okay, how about this one? How about J? Okay, one more. W. Okay, so if you're like most people, you probably thought of a sexual body part or a sexual act. And then you probably had an emotional reaction to that thought. Some people might have felt kind of embarrassed or ashamed. Oh my God, how did I think that? Um, other people might have felt kind of excited, like, I'm going to think about that a little more. <laughs> your, your gut reaction gives you some real insight into your bottom line belief about sex. And in my work, what I have found is that there's two very prevalent bottom line beliefs about sex in our society. And the first one is called the disaster model. And the best example of this comes from a sex ed video that was used in the 80s and 90s called No Second Chance. It was an abstinence-only video, and in it, a little high school kid asked the school nurse who was teaching a sex ed class, what if I don't want to wait until I'm married to have sex? And the nurse looked at the kid and said, well, I guess you'll just have to be prepared to die. <laughs> See, the, the disaster model sees sex exactly like that. It's a disaster waiting to happen. That it's about shame and guilt and fear and Yes, there is some possible way that sex could be nice and good, but in most cases, it's just an invitation to an STD and a lifetime of misery. Now, the second bottom line that I see a lot in society, I call the porn model. And people who follow the porn model buy into two of the biggest myths that pornography offers to us. The first is that everything in life leads to sex. So, a plumbing problem, <laughs> dirty swimming pool, pizza delivery, even a math class is just a prelude to having sex with somebody. Now, I don't know if you've really considered the implications of this, but that means there's a lot of leaky pipes and cold pizzas and unsolved math equations in the world. But that's what you get if Everything's about sex and everything leads to sex. And then the second myth that the porn model gives us, it tells us that the sex that we have isn't really connected to the rest of our lives. And to get my students to think about that, I ask them this question. Have you ever considered the full human lives of the people that you might see in one of those porn scenes? Whether it's the character they play or the actor him or herself. What do you imagine those people are doing 20 minutes after the scene is over. Are they grocery shopping? Are they picking up their kid from daycare? Are they going off to their other job as a research assistant at a biomedical lab? Or do you imagine that they just live right there in that bed or that pool deck or that warehouse? The disaster model and the porn model really get in our way of creating healthy and positive outlooks to sexuality. And so we need a different model for that. And I want to suggest one and see what you think. What if we actually could think about sex and sexuality instead of the disaster model, instead of the porn model, as a form of nourishment? Something that we can use to feed our bodies, our hearts, our minds, our spirits in positive ways. 
If we can connect sexuality and nourishment, it has a few good positive results. Nourishment is something natural and normal and necessary. I'm not saying sexual activity is necessary, but we are sexual people every minute of every day. And that sexuality is an essential part of who we are, and it's normal and it's natural. And also, if we think about nourishment, we know that there's some nourishment that's really good for us and some that's not as good for us. We know that there's some that's more to our liking than others. And we know that the more we know about nourishment and the better we understand it, the better choices we can make about it for ourselves. And maybe we can see sex in the same way. Something that the more we know about it and the more we understand it, the better we can use it to make healthy choices for ourselves. The second thing I think we can do to get our hearts and minds in a better place about sex is to change the way we think about our genitals. So I want to ask us to revise our genital expectations. So when I teach about genitals in my class, I use this story. I'm going to tell you this story, and I want you to see if you can put yourself in the place of the main character. Okay? So it's a beautiful day here at Wake Forest. You have woken up on time. You went to your first class. It was easy. You aced the quiz that you had. It's going well. And now it's lunchtime, and you're very excited. So you go into the dining hall. You find the table where all your friends are. And as you go to sit down at the lunch table, you realize that something is wrong. And you do a quick check. Keys, cell phone, laptop, OK. And then it hits you. Your genitals have fallen off. Somewhere between breakfast and lunch, you just lost them. And you've been all over this campus. Now, some people would panic at that moment, but you don't. You are a smart and savvy person. You know what to do. You head straight for the Wake Forest Office of Lost and Missing Genitals. And as you go in there, there's a kindly older woman sitting behind the desk, and she's knitting. And you walk in and mumble something about having lost your genitals, and that you turn anything in. And she looks up at you, and she smiles, and she chuckles a bit, and she says, Oh my, yes, dear. It's been a very big day for lost genitals. Uh, if you can just go in the back, they're all there. You just pick out yours, and you can go home. And so you walk into the back room, and you are greeted with, a room full of industrial steel shelving. And filling those shelves are genitals. Some that have just shown up, some that have been there for weeks. All you have to do is pick out your own and you're good to go. So here's the question. Could you pick out your own genitals? Now the boys in my class, class very often laugh when I tell this story. And they say something like this. Duh. I would call his name, he would leap into my arms, and we'd go home. It's the rare man or boy who does not have a close personal relationship with his penis. <laughs> That's actually not a bad thing. It's really healthy. But it's the bravado and it's the swagger that can sometimes come from owning a penis that becomes a problem. And I call that penis arrogance. And uh, penis arrogance tells men that they're better than women just because they have a penis. And it puts men in eternal competition with each other to be more of a man than their friend is. Penis arrogance is something that contributes to sexual assault and sexual abuse because it teaches men to take rather than ask and to put their own needs and their own desires ahead of other people. Penis arrogance breeds homophobia because it tells us that masculinity and heterosexuality are essentially linked, and gay men betray that. No homo dude. But we know that gay and bisexual and queer men can also be impacted by penis arrogance. Penis arrogance is so difficult because what it does is it boxes men into a very tiny, restrictive definition of manhood, where we are willing to sacrifice our authenticity on the altar of the man. Okay, that was heavy. And I don't want you to misunderstand. As a gay man and a penis owner for 50 years, I think penises are great. But they're not lightsabers. They're not weapons 
For measures of virility or power indicators, they do not spew forth the cure for cancer. They do not make one man better than another, and they certainly do not make men better than women. They're just penises. They're multifunctional organs that allow us to pee and reproduce if we want to and feel pleasure. So penis pride? Absolutely. Penis arrogance? No. Okay, so what about the young women in my class? How do they react to the missing genital story? Well, there's a lot less laughter. And it's more the nervous kind of laughter than the fun laughter. There's very little bravado. There's a lot of silence. Many young women will tell me that they would have no hope of picking out their genitals from those shelves. Many say they've never even seen their own vulva. Some of them only at that moment are learning that their genitals are called the vulva. A vagina, just so we're clear, is an internal organ. You can't see a vagina when you look at a naked woman. How come there's so little vulva awareness and vulva pride? Why does our society treat vulvas with such discouragement and I would say disrespect? I mean, think about the common things you might hear about vulvas. That they're mysterious. That they're complicated. That they're smelly. Or that they're ugly. I even go so far as to ask why we're afraid of vulvas and vaginas. Why are there stories about vulvas that trap penises? Or, or vaginas with teeth? How do we help women understand and feel more pride about their own bodies? Events where the vagina monologue is all about helping women feel a sense of empowerment and feel permission to love, appreciate, and look at their vulvas. And that's really good work that we have to continue. The other thing that happens if we revise our genital expectations is we make room for our transgender and intersex and genderqueer brothers and sisters. And we think about people who have spinal cord injuries or other medical conditions that affect genital function and sensation. And we allow for people to live in a world without defining themselves by what's between their legs and how they use it. That's a world I would like to live in. And I think we need to work to make it happen. And lastly, I think we need to really redefine the phrase having sex. If somebody comes to you and says they had sex last night, what do you assume they did? The classic assumption is that they had vaginal intercourse with a penis. Unless the person who comes to you is a gay man, right? Because then it's a different assumption that maybe it was anal intercourse. And when it comes to lesbians having sex, a lot of people just get confused. The definition of having sex is problematic for a couple of ways. One, a, a definition that needs to change based upon the orientation of the people involved is a problem. The very fact that we get hung up on how lesbians have sex shows us that our definition is pretty penis-centric, sort of an artifact of penis arrogance. And lastly, the definition of having sex, vaginal intercourse with a penis, is entirely mechanical. Stick that in there. The definition says nothing about consent, or pleasure, or mutuality, or connection. So what if we could redefine having sex? And I'd redefine it this way. Having sex means consensual activity designed to bring sexual pleasure and satisfaction to the people involved. Now, I've heard a lot of people push back against that definition. They have a lot of problems. They say, but how will we know what people did? Why do we need to know what people did? And if we want to know and they want to tell us, why can't they just name the behaviors they engaged in? And whether they like them or not. Oh, but if we have that definition, we have to talk about sex, and that's really awkward. Well, it's awkward if we don't really believe that sexuality is natural and normal. Oh, but what about the definition of virginity? Isn't it time we got rid of a definition of virginity that divides women into nice girls and sluts and has very little impact on men at all? The reason why I feel so strongly about this is that I see sex as a social justice issue. Our sexuality is a fundamental facet of who we are as people, and we have a responsibility to use it to make a world that is more fair, more equal, more connected, more free, and more loving. 
we have to make a world where what's between our legs and the way we use it is not used to create hierarchies of power and control, but is used to create connection and fellowship and understanding. I hope that's an enticing vision for you. And I hope you'll join me on the journey to help make it happen. Thanks very much. Now, there are so many things that I adore about that uh, TED Talk. Um, I, I encourage you to watch it again and kind of think through the arguments that he's making. Um, be before I get into talking about parents as uh, agents of sexual education, we have to, you know, come to grips with the fact that so often, at least in our cultural context, kids are exposed to one of two basic models, sometimes both. They're exposed to the disaster model and they're exposed to the porn model. And um, they're going to be exposed to both of those models from multiple sources because that's the way our culture tends to be organized. Now, when we talk about parents, in, in American culture, we tend to defer to parents in zones that are considered to be private, um, and we tend to assume that parents will do their job, essentially, to inform children in a socially appropriate way as to what sex is and how it's to be pursued. Um, in the previous TED Talk video, the, those assumptions can't really be relied upon because we're not really seeing that kids are coming into um, their adolescence with the requisite knowledge to have consensual, mutually satisfying sexual experiences. So what can parents do as educators? Um, you know, your authors talk about how sexual socialization and education in, it should involve imparting knowledge. It also involves attitudes and values um, about sexuality. And in, in many ways, you know, parents have to, they either can adopt the doom and gloom disaster model, and unfortunately many parents do that, or they, they simply ignore the fact that there is a porn model and don't assume that their kids will be exposed to pornography. Well, they will be. Um, I would add a third model here, which is the ignore it until it's a problem model. Um, and that can be problematic. You know, parents are, are typically the first source of sexual socialization. Um, and unfortunately, it's usually in the form of rules um, and heavily infused with gender norms um, and norms about the heteronormative uh, nature of the way our culture still looks at sexuality. So many parents start off by being anxious in their discussions with children. We, we tend to make it, you know, that message is in our comedy. It's also in our dramas where parents are supposed to be anxious about the talk. Um, and they're supposed to be so anxious that they infuse fear into their children so that their children might hypothetically avoid sexual behavior until they're out of their, uh, the visual and emotional range of their parents. Um, so again, disaster model. They're more likely to talk about reproduction as a thing to be avoided, um, and they're also less likely to talk about relationships and how to nurture relationships. In addition to that, you know, less likely to talk about relationships, they're not typically talking about consent, how to get it, how to give it. Um, what we do know from research, when parents are open, and they focus on relationships, they focus on consent, they focus on accurate information about physiology and behavior, that kids tend to behave in a more safe and more um, consent-focused way. Um, we also know, though, that timing is important. And if parents are more educated themselves and they understand a lifespan perspective on um, sexual development, they tend to do a better job of consistently across childhood and across adolescence providing useful information to their kids. Now one more TED Talk, <laughs> and this time is, you know, how can parents 
uh, approach that sex talk. Talking to kids about sex and sexuality makes many of us want to run for the hills. Or more accurately, we want to run for the hills, shove the kids into a cave, and retrieve them somewhere around their 25th birthday. Sex perhaps has always been a taboo subject, but in our current sex-saturated culture, we have new challenges for how we raise kids. Between new stories of sexual assault that are now complicated by sexing, by pop culture that sometimes tends to promote sex instead of talent, and marketing campaigns aimed at selling 11-year-olds song underwear, it sometimes seems like we have great rationale for keeping our kids in the dark for as long as possible. But the truth is, our kids live at a time when the lights are always on. By the time they can hold their own heads up on their necks, they're literally looking around, soaking up messages about sex and sexuality from the world around them. So it strikes me as a really good time to be bold in our approach to talking to them about the topic. Here's the rub, though. Sex is still a taboo subject. We think it's dirty and wrong for polite company. We understand that having information about human sexuality supports the decision but we're really not very good at finding information or sharing it. We appreciate that women who dress in particular ways aren't asking for it, but we hold them in contempt for it nonetheless. We celebrate declining rates of teen pregnancy and shame 16-year-olds who get pregnant to parents while finishing high school. We openly read Face the Gray, but we don't tell our sexual partners which parts turn us on the most. This cultural promiscuity, combined with our prudish communication, creates a powerful kind of sexual thing for the younger generation. By the time they hit puberty, they are literally surrounded by sexual messages, very few of which offer open and honest communication about sexual thoughts, feelings, or behavior. Some of the sex education they're given even reinforces this limited idea of sexuality that they're fed by mass media. The early lessons that our kids get are generally surrounded by danger and harm. Dress and act a certain way and you'll be bullied. Do certain things and well, you'll end up pregnant. So look at this beauty. But sexuality is broad, vast, and complex. My fear is when we focus on what's troublesome about sexuality, we're, we're missing all the good things. It's a little like telling young people about world travel by reinforcing that they need to be wary and fearful of pickpockets and thieves. Instead of us filling their minds with all the ways they'll be enriched by food and music and art, history, people, we teach and we teach and reinforce how they need to conceal money belts beneath their clothes. Right from the very beginning, we fill our kids with things, sometimes inadvertently. We teach them that certain parts of their body are a secret and subject to potential harm. We couple this with our habit of giving pet names to our genitalia. Now, don't get me wrong, I am a big fan of slang. And I encourage all of you to come up to me during the break and tell me your favorite euphemism for genitals. Mine is honey pot. But here's the thing, our kids, they need the scientific words before they can enjoy these. Research tells us that when kids are equipped with words like penis, testicles, vagina, and vulva, they're less likely to be victims of sexual abuse because perpetrators seek out kids who don't have the language or skills to communicate clearly. We come by these limitations of sex educators honestly. Let's do a quick poll. Hands up if when you were young, a parent or somebody else sat you down for a really good conversation about sex. Have a look around. All right, so those very few people, keep your hand up if that conversation included the positive aspects of masturbation. 
Yeah. See, for so many people, Sex Education was a biologically accurate book about reproduction left on our bedside table, and no more. Our parents learned sexual fame from there. They taught it to us. Now, many of us have done some work to try and get that. I have done some, but the last time I played Boggle with my kid, I saw, but I didn't write down the word clip. And it wasn't because short forms aren't allowed. See, we all hold some sexual things. But I think we can change that. Whether we're parents, aunts, uncles, grandparents, coaches, teachers, I think we can shift this dial from our shame-filled and hypersexualized culture to one where people respect themselves, respect others, and respect the broad range and incredible power of sexuality. Let's imagine a young, unattached, but sexually active young woman, unafraid that other people will consider her slutty. Let's imagine a young man shaking with emotion during a sexual encounter, able to tell his partner or his friends about his feelings. Achieving this shift requires a big change in how we think and how we act. We have to understand that our kids are sexual beings, even if they're not ready to act on it. We have to understand that it is our responsibility to provide them with the earliest lessons so that they can grow up to be righteous sexual citizens of the world. In terms of our actions, this is really all about talk. We need to talk to young people all the time. We need to talk to our preschoolers when they're back. We need to talk to our tweeners after we watch a terrible rom-com with them. We need to talk to our teens over their blaring music. We can reinforce the messages when they're checking their Tumblr feed, or when we have them hostage in the car en route to hip-hop or hockey practice. We need to talk to them now, while they're young, so that they know it's always a topic of conversation in their home. We need to talk to them now while they're young, so they know we're their allies and not the last person on the face of the planet who could possibly understand. We need to talk to them now while they're young, so we have a chance to overcome our awkwardness and prepare for the growing complex conversations ahead. So, what do we need to talk to them about? There's a lot. But I think there are four key things that we really need to hammer home and it'll fit the dial. The first is that sexuality is natural. It's been around since time of oil and it will continue to be around. We're not born knowing how to be sexual, especially with the larger world around us. So this is about giving kids the form and function of it all. And we need to encourage them to be curious and enthusiastic. And we need to be enthusiastic too, or at least make it. Because when we're not, they can usually tell, and they may take it as a cue for how they're to behave. The second thing that we need to reinforce is that sexuality is life enhancing. We need to tell young people that it's good. Sure, sex is for procreation, which is good, but for the most part, when we are thinking and engaging our sexual selves, we are not thinking about procreation. Sexuality teaches us about ourselves. It informs our beliefs and our values. It provides incredible opportunity for intimacy and love to be expressed. It's physically good for our body. There are so many benefits. It helps us go to sleep. Right? It helps us wake up. It's really good. The next thing that we need to let young people know is that sexuality isn't simple. It's natural. It is life enhancing, but it ain't easy. Our silence on this topic suggests that it's all going to come about effortlessly. Everybody needs to figure out their sexual preferences and identity on their own. But we can help. We can provide the building blocks and help people know that it might take some work over a considerable period of time. So this can be about telling four-year-olds that sex isn't just for baby making. This can be about letting nine-year-olds know 
or that they and everybody else can shop from the boys and girls section of the gap. This is about letting 12 year olds know that to live a fulfilled sexual life, people need to explore and experiment. In fact, kids at this age can hear that desire is complicated. You can't just turn it on when it's convenient. And what's desirable to one person won't necessarily be to the next. That reminds me of porn. You too, right? See, young people are desperate for information and knowledge about sex and sexuality. And since they have virtually unfettered access to internet porn, it seems like a no-brainer to me that we help them understand that porn tends to portray sex and desire in very limited ways. It certainly is not produced to educate. Actors are chosen in part because of their atypical bodies. Camera angles, camera angles, lighting, and editing all create a scene that is not possible in mutually satisfying real life sexual encounters. And finally, in porn, wait for it, pleasure is often stimulated. I know, shocking. I like to imagine young people hitting puberty, understanding that their lives will include things like love and intimacy and lust and desire. With that, I think we can equip them with tools so that when they listen to music, watch movies, they hear the message that sex is titillating but shameful, but they don't integrate it for themselves or for the people around them. With that, they might not feel like they have to be drunk the next time they're engaged in sexual activity. They might even feel safe and secure enough to tell their partners what they want, when they want it, and have it on. The very last thing that I think we really need to hammer home is that sexuality requires care. We need to let our young people know that they can hurt themselves and hurt other people when they're cattle or about it. But talking about care is really different than talking about sex not being safe. Sure, we want kids safe. I just think we can achieve it if we start with the good news story. I started telling my kids just how fabulous sex is, so that when it's time for them to take care, they'll know that sex is a force of good in the world. This came up recently when I told my eight-year-old about sexual assault. We were in the car, and the news was on the radio, and they were reporting on the recent conviction of two teenagers who sexually assaulted another teen who was drunk and unconscious. You can imagine in the moment I thought about keeping him from his ugliness. I thought of keeping him ignorant and innocent in, in the dark. Then I remembered that the lights are never off. So I told him. Part way through the story, he stopped me and he said, so they murdered her. And I told him what sexual assault is. But that moment triggered a tectonic shift in me as a parent. See, I really that I realized that my kids are learning all the time, with or without me. See, murder is a really heavy topic and I had never talked to him about it. Somewhere along the way, he learned it. So yeah, it's heartbreaking that my baby knows about rape and murder. But it's less heartbreaking when I'm the messenger. And it's certainly a lot better than someone who has little connection and even less commitment to my child to fill his mind on such an important issue. Desmond Tutu recently wrote about rape. He wrote that adults often have a mistaken notion that telling children about harsh realities will destroy their innocence. He goes on to say that you don't lose innocence when you learn about you lose innocence when you commit terrible acts. I mostly agree. But what if innocence is lost if we tell our young people about the harsh realities of sexuality without telling them all the benefits and value of sexuality? When we focus on all the harm, it means our education to them is fundamentally about managing danger in their lives. When I hear 
front and say sex. It reminds me of our need for money belts and the fact that we need to be scared when we travel this incredible planet. What if instead of telling young people that they need to practice safe sex, we stick with the alliteration, it's good, and we tell them to practice sensational sex or super sex. It's a short form, just like safe sex, except instead of meaning take precautions or wear a condom, it can mean feel pleasure, make others feel pleasure. Take care and make sure others take care of you. Let's envision a generation of people who endeavor their sexual lives to be ones where they don't have to compromise their needs or wants in order to please another person. Let's imagine a generation of people who talk about what turns them on because they know that the alternative means feeling alienated by their own bodies and desires. Desmond Tutu wrote that a culture of tolerance, honesty, and discussion is the best way to safeguard innocence. We can safeguard our kids. We can tell them more earlier. We can reframe the method from sex as necessary but depraved to sex as important and powerful. Silence and squeamishness is destroying everything that's good about sex and sexuality. We can change that, and our kids deserve no less. Thank you. I think that's an excellent place to stop just to reinforce the message. When you think about having to talk to your kids or your nieces and nephews, whoever they are, the the important messages are that it's sex is natural, that it's life affirming and life enhancing, that it isn't simple and requires and it requires care. Those are really powerful messages and notice how they are very inconsistent with the messages we typically tell parents about having the sex talk with their kid. Um, so I think we'll pause there. Um, this will be the ending of part one of this presentation.